water. It's one of the biggest concerns for farmers today. Across California's vast, lush agricultural communities, you can't go a couple of days or even a couple of miles without hearing one concern or another about the state's water supply. Basically the old technology that's still very common. Bruce Rominger is a lifelong farmer and graduate of the University of California, Davis. He still relies heavily on research and information that comes out of the university. The stuff they're doing now in soil science is fascinating and it's important for what the consequences of the way we farm are for the climate change. He understands the Golden State's dire situation when it comes to water and the lack of it and the importance of farming sustainably for our environment and for the future of his business. You know, that's the challenge for, for me and the rest of my career and for my kids to how, to how to grow these crops and still produce a huge amount of food out here, but not deplete any of our natural resources, whether it's our, our soil or our water. Rominger farms alongside his brother and father on property that's been in their family since the 1800s. He says while they're constantly working to improve their farming operation, changes don't happen overnight. So it's a very complex ecological system we have running out here, and so we can't just flip a switch and make it sustainable, but we have to keep working in that direction. Okay, gracias. Okay. And while Bruce Rominger works his family's land just outside of Davis, a team of researchers from the UC Davis Department of Land, Air and Water Resources are working to find solutions farther south in California's Central Valley. It's considered the epicenter of agriculture for the Golden State and the nation. So the San Joaquin River is the second largest river in California. And as far as water quality impairments go, it's probably one of the more impaired water bodies in California. The San Joaquin River runs right through the heart of the Central Valley and is a source of irrigation water for countless acres of crops. It's also a landing pad for pollutants like nitrogen, phosphorus and pesticides that come from both agricultural and municipal sources. This is a flood irrigation system. You can see the furrows uh, where water runs in between the, the rows. Uh, that excess water will then uh, enter a canal running across the field and then re-enter the irrigation system. So this is a, a diversion from the... Toby Ogene is a soil scientist at UC Davis. For the past six years, he's worked with farmers in San Joaquin County on an innovative plan that can now be seen up and down this river. The solution was to create wetlands between the farm fields and the river. The wetlands act as a filter system, removing an estimated 50 to 90 percent of the contaminants before they return to the river. These relatively small tracts of land um, are providing a very large service and, and filtering vast acreages of land, so it doesn't affect their bottom line much because this was marginal land in the, in the first place. It's estimated that 90 percent of the natural wetlands in this region were removed at one point to make way for farming. Now scientists and farmers are seeing the benefits of restoring them. UC Davis scientist Randy Dahlgren says nitrate levels in this body of water consistently increased for decades until the 1990s and are now holding steady. We've been actively involved with monitoring here to understand what processes are working within the stream. So that's the, the percentage of saturation of oxygen. Dahlgren has been testing and tracking water quality issues on this river for years, most recently working with the U.S. Geological Survey on a joint project looking at one of the main contaminants, nitrate. The question that was being asked is how much of the nitrogen, the nitrate in particular, in the uh, San Joaquin River just behind us here, is coming from groundwater sources. The scientists use a meter with water quality sensors attached to it. And how, what's the electrical conductivity in salt electrical here? conductivity is 2.8 decisiemens per meter. The sensors allow them to look at a variety of things from temperature to salts to how much oxygen is in the water. Is there's very little nitrate making it to the river because we have this natural protection mechanism here of the riparian zone where the soils have no oxygen which leads to the loss of nitrate to the atmosphere. This system, and thanks uh, to research like this, scientists are gaining a better understanding of how many aspects of farming affect our environment. Which Bruce Rominger says helps him to better protect the land that he loves to farm on. We never recognized 
10 years ago that we had to worry about what happens to our fertilizer as it volatilizes and goes up into the atmosphere. But that's an issue that we all have to deal with and Davis is out here with their instruments testing that and telling us when you irrigate this way, when you fertilize this way, this is what happens. Today the Romingers are in the process of switching from furrow irrigation like you see here to an underground drip system that requires less water and means a bigger yield. It's a costly and lengthy process, but Bruce Rominger says the investment is worth it to ensure this soil will remain rich and productive for decades to come. It's not only soil and water that are heavily studied on the UC Davis campus, but also the effects of agriculture on the air we breathe. That's the focus of another researcher who's created a unique facility to study air quality. What you see here are the so-called bovine bubbles, and we built those a couple of years ago, uh, right now, obviously, there are no cattle inside. Frank Mittlerner designed the bubbles as a way to measure the amount of greenhouse gases that cows produce and study how to reduce it. Today, they're moving 14 cows into each bubble, where they'll live for three months while Mittlerner and a team of students make adjustments to what they eat, including trying out a feed additive that could make a difference in the amount of gas they release. Here, we know what the incoming air looks like with respect to these compounds, what the outgoing air looks like, and how fast the air exchanges. So we can calculate very precisely what the contribution is of an individual animal or its waste or the feed or other items um, on air pollutants that we measure. When it comes to air pollutants, Mittlerner says the front end of the cow's feeding cycle is the largest contributor to certain gases, both what cows eat, a fermented feed called silage, as well as what they emit by belching. The process of digestion creates methane gas that cows burp up to release, which is how cows have earned themselves such a bad reputation. Methane is a greenhouse gas that leads to global warming. And that's where Mittlerner's research comes in. What I would really like to strive for is to put some science-based information into the public arena and, uh, and take some of the, the myth out. Which he has already done. Mittlerner challenged a 2006 United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization report that said livestock exceeds transportation in greenhouse gas emissions. The UN report quantified global livestock emissions as being 18%. But Mittlerner's research found that in the U.S., livestock actually contributes only 3.4 percent. It was a discovery that brought him international attention. I'm an internal, uh, eternal optimist, but um, these challenges that we are facing are indeed substantial. Today, Mittlerner serves as chair of a global partnership project to assess the environmental impacts of livestock production. It is a U.N. appointment. He says that in order to feed our growing population, we need to find new ways to create more food with less of an environmental impact. There's no other country in the world that uses fewer animals to produce a given amount of food than what we do here. The average cow in California produces 20,000 pounds of milk. In Mexico, a cow produces 4,000 pounds of milk. And in India, one cow equals only 500 pounds of milk. From now on, every 11 years, we add another billion people to the world population. Within my lifetime, the human population has doubled. And here comes the big problem. The land that we use to feed all the people in the world, the arable land that can be used for crop or animal production, is a set amount and cannot be increased. We have to continually improve what we're doing because obviously what everybody's doing on this planet is not sustainable. So. It all comes back to sustainability, farming this land intensively, profitably, and carefully. These are enormous challenges that our next generation of farmers will face, but they'll do so armed with answers that researchers are seeking right now. Less land, less water, um, higher prices for all your inputs. Um, you're going to have more regulation um, and that's a constant battle for farmers. Finding that balance is really hard, um, and, and, and I don't know if we know it yet, but we're, we're getting, making progress. I believe with the, the education and the science that's ongoing, we will be able to come up with practices that will be environmentally sustainable, while at the same time feeding uh, more people. I think UC Davis is, um, is really a role model with respect to marrying agricultural productivity 
and environmental impact research. This is really the, the university where the nexus of productivity and environmental quality research uh, takes place.